Well, good morning. Oh, we can do better than that. Good morning. So I'm used to interacting with kids, and, uh, and I get, they, get, they scream really loud when I say good morning with that. Um, if you're a kid here and you're in the service this morning, would you do me a favor, raise your hand really, 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 really high, because we have an activity pack for you, and if you fill it out, there's sermon notes, if you fill it out and take it to the cafe, uh, you can get uh, donuts. And so, uh, so if you're a kid here, or if you're an adult and you want to pretend like you're a kid to get a free donut, raise your hand really, really high, the ushers will, will go through, and, and you can raise them high, they'll bring it right to you guys. Uh, like Tyler said, my name's uh, Brett Jensen. I've been a member here of Chino Valley Community Church uh, my entire life. Um, I was born into the church going here. I was baptized uh, over there uh, and I was in junior high. And then I got married right here to my beautiful wife, Stephanie. Um, and so I've been a part of this church as long as I can remember. I've served in various roles here. I've been a pastoral intern uh, to a college director, and currently I work as a high school math teacher, and I volunteer just wherever needed. If you have kids in this church, uh, and they go to our kids program, or they came to VBS, they'll know me as Brett, the cool kid, with two T's, okay? And so, uh, and so if you have them, I don't know where they got that name from, but that's what they call me, and so if you, but don't worry, you guys can just call me just Brett, okay? Uh, so my wife, Steph, and I, when we were early into our dating relationship, we, uh, we liked to meddle into other people's lives. It was something that we kind of enjoyed doing. And so we had, a lot of, uh, we had a lot of single friends. And so Steph would have her group of single friends, and I had my group of single friends. And our goal was to see, hey, how about that person and that person? And we would try to like orchestrate like, kind of like a blind date setup, a meeting between them, and, so, and see what, how it would work out. Because we thought, man, if our friends would date, then we could like go on double dates. And then like, oh my gosh, maybe we have friends that we both like. And like, it'd be like really, really cool. And so one of these scenarios, Steph and I decide that we're going to pair up two of our friends, Carrie and Roots. And so Steph goes to her friend Carrie and she goes, hey, Carrie, I got this guy. It's one of Brett's friends. His name's Roots. He's handsome. He's Christian. He's single. He's kind. And she goes, uh-huh, uh-huh. And she goes, well, would you? And she goes, fine, fine, fine. Right? And she goes, yeah, he, she's in. Right? And I go, okay, Roots, 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 Roots. I got this girl. Uh, she's, she's a Christian girl. And let's just say like the Holy Spirit is looking good on her. Right? And he like stops me on. He, goes, he doesn't go any further. And he goes, done. Right? He goes like, tell me where. Right? And I'm like, all right, sweet. So, so we go, we, we orchestrate this meeting. But they go, guys, we don't want to be set up on like a blind date. We want to meet a, like more natural feeling. And I was like, well, like, what do you guys mean? Like, let's just, let's plan a group outing and then we'll meet each other there and see what happens. So we, we decide to oblige their request and we decide to go meet at a country line dancing club. Okay. Um, uh, we go there, we meet, uh, Carrie goes there with her girlfriends, Steph and I drive there and we're all kind of hanging out there. And then all of a sudden in a route, he walks into the, the line dancing club. I've never seen homeboy with a beard before, but he's got a beard on. Okay. I don't know where it grew from. He's got a flannel on. I've never seen him had a flannel, but he is ready, committed to the line dancing vibe, right? He's, he's all the way in. And as he walks in, we have them meet. And as soon as they start meeting, we do the, the proper thing of, of like turning our backs to them, right? And just letting them have their own kind of conversation. That conversation goes on for about an hour before they eventually go onto the dance floor. And you can basically see stars in their eyes and you could put like a heart bubble emoji like over their heads, right? They're having a great time. And by the end of the night, they're two stepping their way through the dance floor, right? And Steph and I are driving home and I look at her and this is in the, in the middle of May. And I look at her and I go, I bet you they're going to be engaged by Christmas. And she looks at me and goes, no way, not, not a chance. Sure enough, they got engaged December 19th, six days before Christmas. Um, and then they just, last week, we just hung out with them. They celebrated their 11-year anniversary. Pretty cool story. Yeah, amazing story. And so what Steph and I did is we orchestrated a meeting between two people for a specific purpose. Our purpose was that they would meet and then hopefully they would date and possibly even get married. In our passage this morning, we're going we're to look at God. God is going to orchestrate a meeting between two different people to teach them a lesson. He's going to have a very specific purpose in doing that. And in doing that, we're going to be studying in the book of Acts. If you've been with us in Chino, uh, for the last few months here at this, church, at this church, we've been studying the book of Acts. Back, Acts is, written by, uh, is authored by Luke. Luke actually authored two books. The first one is called the book of Luke, go figure, uh, which is uh, what we call a gospel, one of the biographies of Jesus' life. It explains who Jesus is, and it explains what Jesus came to do here. The second book is, is known as the Acts of the Apostles, which we abbreviate to Acts. In this, in this book of Acts, it's the follow-up or the aftermath. After Jesus died, he was raised from the grave, and then he resurrected up, or he ascended into heaven. Then we see what happens after that. It's the sequel to, this, to, to Luke. 
And so we're studying this book in Acts uh, chapter 10 is we're going to be this morning. But if you have a Bible, would you open up first to Acts chapter 1? Okay. In Acts chapter 1, we get what is called like the key verse. Now, I'm not an English major, but English people, um, this is like the key verse. And if you're ever going to highlight or underline any verse in the entire book of Acts, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is the key verse here. In Acts 1.8, it says this, it says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. If you're going to highlight or underline any like part, any verse, anywhere, this is the one. This Acts 1.8 lays out what the entire book is going to be formatted. We see that in Acts chapters 1 through 7, we see that the gospel is going out to Jerusalem. And see right on that little dot there on that map, that's Jerusalem in comparison to the whole, the whole world right there. And that in Acts chapters 1 through 7, we see that the disciples are being Jesus' witnesses. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they're witnessing to people around them about who Jesus is just in Jerusalem. And in Acts chapters 1 through 7, you see that. Then in chapters 8 through 12, the gospel goes out to Judea and Samaria. In chapters 8 through 12, it's Judea and Samaria. And then finally, uh, chapters 13 through 28, it's to the ends of the earth. And so uh, we see how the gospel is kind of spreading out. And this, is, this was what Jesus told his disciples was going to happen, that it's going to go out exactly in this way. And so what we're doing is we're diving in, at, in the middle of Acts chapter 10. Okay? So we're part of that Judea and Samaria is where we're at this morning. Uh, and in Acts chapter 10, remember, God is going to orchestrate a meeting between two people for a very specific purpose. If you have your Bibles, open up to flip over to Acts chapter 10. It's a few chapters to the right. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 23 this morning. And I'm going to start by reading verses 1 through 8. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of, of what was known as the Italian cohort. A devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who tended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So, opening scene here. We start with scene one where we go to uh, Caesarea. Caesarea is a city in Judea along the Mediterranean coast. It's named after the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus, and it's the center of Roman administration for this area. So remember that this is during the time that all of the Jewish nation, the Israelites, were under the Roman rule. And so we're in Caesarea, and then we get introduced to our first, our first character of the story, Cornelius. And we learn a few things right away about him, that he's a centurion of the Italian cohort. A centurion would be a Roman soldier, and by name, centurion means by name in charge of up to 100 men. The centurions were the backbone of the Roman army uh, during this time. And centurions would be responsible and, and able to follow directions. They'd be able to delegate, able to lead. They were like the first lieutenant above all the, all the normal soldiers. And so we know that Cornelius is then a centurion. So we know these things are most likely to be true about him. But it goes on. It gives us more. It says that he is a devout man who feared God. That he's a devout man who feared God. That means that Cornelius had undoubtedly grown up hearing about the Roman gods. But he recognized there's something different about this Jewish God. That he is, that he is what, what devout meaning faithful and committed. And then it continues on describing more attributes about him that he, that he gave alms to the needy and he prayed continually. Giving alms means giving money or even food to those in need. And then he prayed continually. Later in verse 22, we find out that he's well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation. I mean, Cornelius has like a, a pretty good rap sheet. If you're trying to find a guy who checks all the boxes of what a Christian would look like, Cornelius is it. He's seeking out God, but there's only one problem. Cornelius isn't fully in. See, in order to be fully in at this time and be accepted by God at this time, Cornelius would need to be fully committed to the Mosaic law. That means he would have to become a proselyte or a convert, okay? And then he would have to convert to all the Jewish customs, traditions, and even be circumcised. And so Cornelius is, is, is seeking, but he's not all the way there. 
And then this is where our story takes off. So we learn about who Cornelius is, and then we find out here in verse, uh, uh, verse 3 that it's at the ninth hour. Now, the ninth hour means nine hours after sunrise or after 6 a.m. So this is about 3 in the afternoon. Cornelius is praying, and an angel comes to him in a vision, calls Cornelius by name. Make no mistake, Cornelius, this isn't an angel coming for like a random person. This isn't an angel who's like, oh my gosh, there's somebody praying here, right? It goes, hey, Cornelius, specifically, I'm coming to you. And Cornelius, as he has this vision, Cornelius has three responses that we need to take note of. The first one um, comes in verse four. It says that as he stared at him in terror, he stared at him in terror, Cornelius responds in fear. Stared in terror, the Greek word there is emphobos, which is where we get the word phobia. He recognizes that he's interacting with a holy angel and this fear of awe and reverence overcomes him. It's as Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so he interacts with the angel and his first response is fear. It is one of awe and reverence. The second response Cornelius has here is that Cornelius responds, willing to listen. He responds, willing to listen. He responds, what is it, Lord? He doesn't respond, hey, what do you want? Hey, what do you got for me? It's a response of, what do you have for me? Now, I have two little boys. I have a a, a five-year-old bear and a nine-year-old, I don't know, around here, Jack, okay? And when I ask them something, they give me two different types of responses sometimes. Sometimes they respond with no sass. Okay? And I say, hey, Jack Bear, I have something to tell you. And my youngest one will still say, yes, daddy. And my other one now goes, yes, dad. Right? And they go, what, what do you have for me, dad? But sometimes now when I, respond, I call their name, I go, hey, Jack Bear, I got something for you. They go, yeah, dad, what? Tell me. <sighs> right? And I get the eye roll, I get the shoulders, I get all that stuff. Cornelius here, we see he responds willing to listen. He goes, what is it, Lord? Like, what, what do you have for me? And then the angel responds and he gives instructions. In the middle of verse 4, it says, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. This memorial is, a, is Old Testament language of God has noticed your life. He notices you are seeking him out. And then he gives him instructions. He says, Now send men to Joppa and uh, bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner. So he gives instructions. He says, Hey, you're going to go send people to Joppa. You're going to get this guy, Simon Peter, and then you're going to bring him back to Caesarea. And he's got a message to tell you. So Cornelius then, he sees this and he's got two Simons, right? And the first Simon is Simon the Tanner. Now, uh, Ken Greek last week spoke on what a tanner is, but in case you weren't here or you forgot, a tanner is someone who worked with tanning leather, which may sound cool until you understand that's, that's working with dead animal skins all the time, okay? And so tanners were, were very, very stinky, and so they put them on the outside of town so that they wouldn't stink up everything, okay? I think of kind of, kind of like the garbage men, right? We don't want our dump like right in the middle of the city, right? These tanners are very stinky, and so this tanner, this Simon uh, the Tanner was, was located by the sea. And then there's another Simon, he says, he's staying with Simon the Tanner. It won't be hard to find him, just follow your nose and head to the sea. But he's staying with this other Simon, this other Simon Peter is staying with him. And he, Simon Peter is who we often refer to as Peter. He's one of Jesus' closest disciples, And then Cornelius, we see his third response here. His third response is that Cornelius responds with obedience. He delegates three of his men. Two are his servants and one of his his soldiers. And he tells them them the message, go find this Simon Peter and bring him back to him. Go go from Caesarea, go down to Joppa, and then get him and then come back. Now, in today's day and world, you would just give give him a call, right? Right? Look him up on Google, give him a call and say, hey, I ordered you an Uber, head back over here, right? But this is impossible back then. Joppa is about 30 miles away, and so it's about a one-day journey. I was curious how far 30 miles would be. That's about the distance from us walking from Chino Hills all the way to Newport Beach, which, by the way, is possible, okay? Uh, according to Google Maps, it says it would take 11 and a half hours, okay? And I, I challenge anyone to do that, okay? And let me know how that goes for you. Okay, so, so they travel, they walk all the way there, and he sends them out there. And we see Cornelius' response here. He responded three ways. He responded in fear, willing to listen, and with obedience. And it made me wonder. I stopped and thought, how do we approach and respond to God? How do we approach and respond to God? 
See, Cornelius approached God during a regular time of prayer. And he listened and he obediently followed. How often do we respond to God not like that? When we go to God, either we don't go to God at all in regular prayer, or when we go to God, all we do is lay our petitions before him, say amen as fast as we can, and move on. He was able to go make his petitions, and he just waited. He was willing to listen. I mean, can you imagine if Cornelius responded to God and went, hey, oh, yeah, about that. So I got a really busy day today. I don't know if you know, I'm a centurion. I'm kind of important around here. Okay, so I got a lot going on. I don't, you know what, God, I'll, I'll see if I can pencil you in. I'll see if I can make time in my schedule for you. He doesn't respond that way. No, he says, right away, I will do it. And I kept wondering, man, I wonder if we do that with God. Do we, do we respond in fear, willing to listen and with obedience? And notice, out of all this stuff, Cornelius doesn't know why. Cornelius doesn't know why. Like, why would God choose to do it this way? Like, if God could send an angel and give him a message, why not just tell him what the lesson is? Why not just tell him what the point is right there? Right? But he doesn't. And Cornelius doesn't ask questions. He just says, yes, Lord. Okay, let me see what the lesson is. You'll teach me eventually. You've gotten me this far. Let's see what happens. And at this point now, we're going to cut scenes. We cut from our, our first character, Cornelius, Cornelius, and we're going to cut over to Peter. And we're going to look at that in verses 9 through 16. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending and being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice, of, uh, the voice came to him a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. So the next day, we, we, we fast forward a day. Cornelius sent his men. They're on, they're on their 11 and a half hour walk, their 30 mile journey to Joppa. And we, we cut over to, to Peter. Peter's in Joppa, which is also located on the Mediterranean Sea. And he's with Simon the Tanner. And he's at the six hour praying. Again, six hours past 6 a.m. would be about noon. So he's on the rooftop praying. Now, this may sound weird to us. I, I'm, I'm kind of a scaredy cat. I'm kind of afraid of heights. So the idea of climbing on a rooftop for anything sounds miserable to me, let alone to pray unless I'm just praying for fear of my life, okay? So, but he goes up on the rooftop, and this was totally normal back then. The rooftops were flat, and it was like a patio. And, it, and being removed from Simon the Tanner, maybe above some of the smells, okay? And this would be a quiet place. And by the sea, you may have this like coastal breeze. So it sounds like a pretty sweet place for a quiet time. And so he's out there praying, and all of a sudden as he's praying, he gets hungry. He gets a distraction, and he wants some food. And so he calls down and says, hey, could you guys make me some, some food? Whether this is his first meal or he's having second breakfast, okay? He calls down and says, hey, I need some food. And then he falls into a trance, meaning he's going to have a vision. And this vision is this, that the heavens opened up and a great sheet is descending, being let down by its four corners. And in it were all kinds of animals, reptiles and birds of the air. And God says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now in my family, you wouldn't have to tell me twice. I'd be like, barbecue time, let's go, I'm on it. Let's eat some food, like it's grub. But for a Jew, this would have been totally strange. This would have been totally strange. Jewish um, had food restrictions from God as to what animals are okay to eat and what animals are never to be eaten. Some foods were kosher or fit and proper and clean. And other foods were non-kosher or unfit or unclean. And what I want to do is I want to take us back to understand where, where did God say that and what does that happen? So if you have your Bibles, flip all the way back to Leviticus chapter 11. So leave your thumb in Acts 10 because we're going to go back there. But Leviticus chapter 11. So it's a little bit of a turn. You have, it's the third book in the Old Testament. So it's, it's pretty early in there. In my Bible, it's page 88, which probably is not very helpful for you. Okay. Um, in Leviticus chapter 11, so Leviticus is God delivering his ordinances, his rules, his laws uh, to the people so that they know how does God desire them to live. 
And so in Leviticus chapter 11, this is then where God's going to describe what foods are proper, what foods are clean, and what foods are unclean. What foods are you allowed to eat as a Jew in Israel? What foods are you not? And so we're not going to read through all of 11, but I want to read through the first eight verses with you. In Leviticus 11, uh, verses 1 through 8, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, These are living things that you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. So here's the things that they can't eat. Whatever parts the hoof and is cloven-footed and chews the cud. Among the animals you may eat. Okay, so there's the list of what they could eat. Nevertheless, among those that chew the cud or part the hoof, uh, you, may not, uh, you shall not eat these. First, the camel, because it chews the cud and does not part the hoof, it is unclean to you. And the rock badger, because it chews the cud and does not part the hoof, it is unclean to you. And the hare, because it chews the cud but does not part the hoof, it is unclean to you. And the pig, okay, this is where we all sigh, aw, right? Because it parts the hoof and is cloven-footed, but it does not chew the cud, and it is unclean to you. Okay, that means no bacon, people. Pay attention there. Okay, um, you shall not eat any of their flesh. You shall not touch their carcasses. Uh, they are unclean to you. And then the verses 9 through 43 still going into all the other animals, the birds, the reptiles, the insects, which, by the way, what insects are clean and unclean is very odd to me. I'm kind of like an anti-insect person. I'm like a vegetarian of the insect nation, okay? Um, and, so, uh, and so God lays out all these different rules, and you may be wondering, like, why, God? Like, is there something special about this animal and not this animal? Is that a dietary, like, help? Like, what, what's the purpose of it? And God answers that question in verse 44 of chapter 11. He says that it'll come up on the screen. You can look on your Bibles too. You can underline it because this is a really important verse. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy. Why? For I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. And you shall be holy for I am holy. What's God's purpose in this? God's purpose is saying, hey, I want you guys to have a physical representation of how you look different, how you look holy or set apart. Why? Because I am holy. I am set apart. I am different than any other God out here. And the way that I'm going to help you guys understand that and show that to the rest of the world is you guys are going to be holy. You guys are going to be set apart. And so God lays this out and he says, okay, you're going to eat these things and not eat these things because I am holy. And so now we go back to this passage in Acts 10, and Peter sees all these animals being let down. Some of them are clean animals, and some of them are unclean animals, and God says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And I just picture, out of all the animals, I picture the pig kind of coming to the edge of the sheet, right? Just out there kind of glowing, right? And Peter's eyes getting really, really wide, Right? Because I don't know if you guys are anything like me, but I love bacon. Okay? Like, like bacon is one of the food groups of like my family. It's like bread, meat, cheese, in and out, bacon. Like, like those, those, like that, that's, that, that's what we eat, right? So I love all kinds of bacon. I mean, bacon is like, bacon is so good. Like bacon and eggs, it's good as a standalone. Bacon inside like a breakfast burrito at Bravo, okay? Like they have at restaurants now what's called bacon steak. You can order it as an appetizer sometimes, which is just like bacon you get to like slice through and eat, okay? And like you, you wrap bacon in other foods to eat it, right? Like it, like it just tastes so good. Like you wrap a hot dog or a burger or like bacon is so, I mean, sometimes you used to wrap bacon with bacon just because it's so stinking good. So I see Peter seeing all these animals coming down and Peter going, yes, Lord, bacon! No. <laughs> Wouldn't that be so great? That's not how Peter responds at all. Peter responds thinking it's a test. Peter responds thinking it's a test. He responds this way. He goes, by no means, Lord. By no means, Lord. Notice the contradiction in that. By no means, Lord. Peter recognizes he's interacting with God, but then he's choosing to tell him, oh, no, 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 no. Right? He's following this gut response because this, this idea of what he eats and doesn't eat is so much a part of his identity and so much a part of his culture. He goes, no, God, there's no way I could do that. And the intent is, I don't plan on starting now. Peter believes that this is a test, that he's just hungry. They're preparing food and he's having a dream about some food. And he doesn't want to give in. He doesn't want to break this identity, this cultural norm that he has in him. 
And God responds this way. He responds with what God has made clean, do not call common. Then this vision occurred three times. Now, repetition was really big in the Jewish culture. Repetition for us is, is generally a pretty big deal. If I told you the same thing three times, I would hope that you remember it. When I teach math to my students, I tell them a lesson, and every day we review that lesson. I tell them it over and over and over again because I need them to freaking remember it. I'm like, come on, people. You got to learn this. Right? So God gives this vision three times. But for Peter, this would have been even more significant. Remember, Peter, in Luke chapter 22, was the one who denied knowing Jesus three times before he was crucified. Then in John chapter 21, after Jesus rose from the grave, Peter was reaffirmed three times when Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And he responded, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And this happened three times. And so this vision occurring three times would have clearly stood out to him. It would have broken his gut response of what he just said, and he would have had to stop. And again, notice in this vision, I couldn't help but wonder as I, was, as I was reading and studying this passage, like God could have just been direct in telling Peter the lesson here. Like, don't you see that? God could send a, a vision and an angel and he could do all these things. He could just say, hey, Peter, I have a lesson for you. Here it is. But he doesn't do it that way. Instead, he gives him this vision and he has him stop and has to think about it. Because God's got a bigger lesson to teach both of them. And as we dive in, we're going to read the last part of our passage this morning as we try to get through it. Uh, Acts chapter 10, verses 17 through 23. It says, now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, told you, uh, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear what you have to say. So he, Peter, invited them in to be his guests. Then he rose the next day and went away with them. And some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. We see Peter's second response here. He first responded thinking it's a test. And his second response is Peter responds by reflecting. Peter responds by reflecting. He was inwardly perplexed. Possibly thinking this vision is about food or maybe he was just hungry. Okay? And then in verse 19, we see that he was pondering the vision. He's responding by, okay, God, what is your purpose in this? I thought so often when things go out weird in our lives, we're trying to make sense of things. Often our approach to God, when something goes on that we don't understand, we go, how does that fit my life? Instead of, God, what do you have for me here? What is your purpose here? And Peter is tra stopping trying to think and trying to figure it out. And at this exact moment when he's trying to figure it out, we hear the... Cornelius' crew shows up in Joppa and they arrive at the house, right? They ask, hey, where's Simon the Tanner? And they're like, dude, just follow your nose. You're going to get there, okay? And so they head over there and they knock, 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 right at this exact moment when Peter's trying to figure it out, before there's any delay, these guys come and they go, hey, we're looking for Simon Peter. We were sent here by this guy Cornelius, okay? And we're trying to find him. And Peter, who maybe not have figured it out, the Holy Spirit comes to him and says, Rise and go without hesitation, for I have sent them. He's saying, Peter, there's a bigger lesson. Obey, and you will see. And Peter responds, his third response here is Peter also responds with obedience. Peter responds with obedience. And here's what he did. Verse 23. He invited them in to be his guests. Now, you may read that and go, so what? People show up at my house that they walked all the way from Chino Hills to Newport Beach and they knock, 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 and they said they came. Like, of course I'd open the door. Come on in. What do you guys need? Do you go to the bathroom? Need some food? But this was a big deal back then. This was a very, very big deal because Peter was a Jew and these people are coming in or were Gentiles, which means non Jew. And, and them coming into Peter's house would make them ceremonially, make the Jews ceremonially unclean. 
I mean, this was going to be breaking a cultural norm. And notice Peter didn't let a cultural norm, what was expected by other people around him, interfere with obedience to God. He didn't, didn't let a cultural norm, what was, it, what was expected by other people of him, interfere with obedience to God. And he invites them in to be his guests. See, Peter is just starting to get it in, a, in, a, in about one day time frame in here. He's going to fully be able to verbalize it. He is starting to understand what it meant when Jesus said in Acts 1.8 to Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That Peter is learning that what God has made clean is not referring to food, but to people. You see, from the Jewish perspective, all, all the, until this time, the Gentiles were unclean. And God said in Peter's vision, I have made them clean. See, in the Bible, the process of making some, something unclean is called desecration. And this happens through sin. But the process of making something clean or even holy is called consecration. And this happens through sacrifice. In the Old Testament, this often meant sacrificing a perfect animal. But what God is saying is because of Jesus' perfect life and his sacrifice on the cross, that he has made a way for all people to have a right relationship with him. This is in, in John 1.29 when he sees Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What a profound statement that was. Behold, look, look, pay attention. The Lamb of God who's going to be sacrificed that takes away the sin of the Jews. No, the sin of the world. And Peter's starting to get it. And so we start asking this question then, what is God's purpose in orchestrating a meeting between Cornelius and Peter? What is God's purpose in orchestrating a meeting between Cornelius and Peter? Like, God, why, why are you doing this? And here it is. Here's the point. To teach them that the gospel is for everyone. To teach them that the gospel is for everyone. You see, Peter needed to learn this lesson that the gospel is not just restricted for Jews only. See, God's people used to be only the Jewish nation. And this is changed specifically because of Jesus. Jesus' purpose was that he came to earth and acknowledged how the Old Covenant, how all the, what's in the Old Testament here of sacrifices and atonements led the way for him. Jesus fulfilled the law and the covenants as he said he would. You don't have to flip there, but in, in Matthew chapter 5, here's what Jesus says before he dies. And people are wondering about who this guy is. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or prophets. No, I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. See, Jesus is the final sacrifice because he is perfect. And God's kingdom is not restricted or limited to a specific people or culture. That the God's kingdom is for everyone who calls him Lord. And in case you're sitting here and you go, I don't know what that is, Brett. Let me try to break that down for you as simply as I would teach kids, as I teach adults, as I would talk to my friends. That the gospel, I'm going to break it down as simply as I can. That the gospel is this. And then in Colossians 1, 16 and 17, that he is over all creation. That all dominion and authority belongs to God. And that God loves us. And we matter to God. But then here's what happens. Let me say it this way. Sin is anything I do. I think or I say that God does not want me to do, think, or say. And the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all of us have sinned. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so here's the problem. The problem is that our relationship is broken. The problem is our relationship is broken. That the punishment for sin is death. Romans 6.23 says this, for the wages of sin is death. What that means is the wage is what you would earn. What we earn from our lives, from our sinful nature, what we earn from that is death. And death being we have a death penalty that when we go to meet God, we would have to be separated from him forever, for eternity. And this is the problem that our relationship is broken. And God recognizes this problem and God fixed it. Here's how God did it. God rescues us. 
God rescues us to fix this broken relationship. He sent his son Jesus to come live a perfect life and die on the cross as payment for our sins. This is Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us for that payment. And then our choice is we can respond. We can respond. We can enter into a relationship with God. Jesus is offering us a gift of being saved. And I tell it to students this way, and I tell it to kids this way. I break it down as simply as I, as I possibly can. If you want to respond to that, I call it the ABCs. Here's what you have to do. You admit, you believe, and you commit. The first thing is you admit that you're a sinner. You admit that you, that you have messed up. You have made an offense to a holy God. That you have done, thought, or said things that God did not want you to do, think, or say at some point in your life. The second part is the B is to believe. To believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that he died on the cross as payment for your sins. And then the C is to commit. That you commit to following God all the days of your life. That doesn't mean that you're going to do it perfectly. Heaven knows I don't. But that you're committed to walking in a way that you're trying to honor God. That you're growing in your relationship with him. And you thank him for restoring that. See, God is orchestrating this meter, this meeting between Peter and Cornelius to teach them that the gospel is for all. That's the gospel. He, God's saying, hey, Peter, this gospel is for everyone. It's not just for the Jews. You see, Peter, next week you'll see, Peter's able to verbalize it in Acts 11, 34 and 35. He says, so Peter opened his mouth. This is after he meets with Cornelius, a little preview for next week. Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Paul said it this way in Romans uh, 10, uh, verses 12 and 13. He says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This lesson is one we need to apply to our lives today. We all desperately need the gospel. And you may think you come from a background that's maybe a little bit more acceptable, that your life has been a little bit more buttoned up than other people, that you haven't really made any, you haven't done any big offenses to God. And you're in this camp. But there's other people that go, oh man, if God knew all the stuff in my life, there's no way. There's no way he could save me. And this passage is to break through all those misconceptions that we all desperately need the gospel and we all need Jesus and anyone and everyone who puts their trust in him will be a part of his kingdom. See, Peter now has confidence in the direction of the gospel. Peter has confidence in the direction of the gospel. God orchestrated this meeting to teach Peter an experiential lesson. See, God could have just told Peter, he could have just told Cornelius, hey, the gospel's not just for the Jews, it's for the Gentiles as well, go tell them. No, no, no. God is setting up this meeting so they have an experiential lesson. It is one that Peter is going to learn so well that he's going to recount in Acts chapter 11. He's going to go, no, no, God taught me something. I saw it with my eyes. I experienced it. He's going to recount it again in Acts 15 when he's with the disciples and they're going to go, hey, do they have to follow this whole stuff? And Peter's going to go, no, I remember this lesson. God has given Peter an experiential lesson. And God chooses to partner with us in his ministry, not because he needs us, but because it grows our faith and understanding of who he is. Let me conclude this way. If you're sitting here and if you don't know you're part of God's kingdom, man, I'm gonna encourage you, don't leave without making that change. Don't, don't leave here without responding to that gospel that you could feel God calling on your heart and you have the opportunity to respond in obedience. And if that's you here this morning, find me afterwards, find people on the crosses or, or talk to somebody who brought you or just talk to somebody and, and ask them, hey, I want to I wanna learn more about Jesus. Ask some questions. But there's probably also another camp, you guys that are here, that you've committed your life to Christ. You've, you know this gospel and you go, I believe that. And this lesson should be a, 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 this should be a lesson to us that no one, that no one is disqualified for the gospel. You see, we all carry this prejudice in our heart that there are certain people in our lives that we have written off. 
They go, there's no way, there's no way they could receive the gospel. And we need to surrender that prejudice to God and be obedient to showing love to those around us. There are people in your life that need Jesus. I had this written as if there are people in your life that need Jesus, and I just crossed out that word if. It's not an if. There are people in your life that you interact with that need Jesus. Maybe you can be the one who shares with them who Jesus is and what his purpose was. The question is, do you look for those opportunities and do you take them when they come? Let me, me finish with this illustration. I have, uh, I'm rounding third coming home, don't worry. I got two boys, okay? I have a uh, five-year-old boy and a nine-year-old boy and they absolutely love watching this YouTube channel called Dude Perfect. Okay. If you haven't ever seen it, it started with five college dudes that they were just kind of college roommates and hung out with each other. And they decided that they were going to go to someone's backyard and start making trick shots. And so they're doing all these ridiculous trick shots and, and basketball shots and they're bouncing a ball off a roof and kicking it in and all these crazy stuff. And they make this cool YouTube video and they post it. And it catches like wildfire. And all of a sudden, they build this channel. All of a sudden, they have, they've grown. They keep doing more and more different types of trick shots, not just basketball, but all kinds of trick shots where they're like going out of an airplane and throwing a ball down or off like high buildings. And they're doing all these ridiculous stuff. And then they even build like these different funny segments. And they build this huge following that there's over 50 million subscribers to this YouTube channel, Dude Perfect. Yeah. And my kids absolutely love it. And so for Christmas, what we decided to get them is they did, they're so big now that they're doing live shows. Okay, so for Christmas, we decided we were going to get them tickets to go see a live show. Now, they didn't come out to California on this tour, so we had to choose either between Las Vegas or Phoenix, uh, and so we chose Phoenix. And so two weeks ago, we went to Phoenix, Arizona, which, by the way, Phoenix in the middle of summer is not a bueno, okay? It's no good. Don't do that, okay? So, um, so we, we choose to do that. It's like 115. It's like, it's like hot, and like not even the pools are cold. Okay? This is all like new to me, okay? Many of you guys could have already told me that, but I'm not that smart. So we get to Phoenix there, okay? And we go, and we're like, oh, it's going to be so great. And we go see their live show. And it's epic. I mean, they got guys like throwing footballs from like the, the top of like a huge stadium down to this bucket. They're launching bow and arrows across there, shooting at gongs. It seems like the coolest thing ever. My kids are just like, like cheering and happy and they got their hats and it's, right? and, and it's, it's super fun. It's a great time. And right before they sign off, they have this sign off where they go like pound it, noggin, see ya. And right before they do that, one of the guys, Tyler, stands up and goes, hey guys, we're about to sign off real quick, but before we do that, we have something really important we want to share with you guys. So we're going to sign off, then we're going to go backstage, we're going to grab a water, then we're going to come back out, and we want to share with you guys something that's really, really important to us. And so they do the pound at Nog and see, and they say, you're welcome to leave, but we encourage you to stay. And so we say, yeah, we're staying, we're here. Like, we're, we're, it's, it's hot outside, we're staying in here, okay? So we sit in there, and then they, they pound at Nog and see, they go back, they all, all five guys come out. And one of them gets up, and he shares the gospel with the entire arena. In a similar way that I just shared the gospel there. He shared the gospel with everyone. This is not something they had to do. This is something they probably even got advised not to do. They go, you may lose some fans if you preach your faith here. But they said, there's no way we're going to take an opportunity like this. With this many people gathered and not preach the gospel. Not give people an opportunity to respond who Jesus is. And I left that thinking, oh my gosh, what an incredible display of faith. What an incredible display of faith that my kids got to see their role models preach Jesus. I couldn't be more in love with their YouTube channel now. Hey, you want to watch them? Yeah, go watch them. Me too. <laughs> my question for you is, do you take those opportunities in your life to share the gospel? Do you look for those opportunities with your coworkers, with your friends? with your classmates to share the gospel? Are you making those opportunities? And when you have them, are you bold enough to proclaim them? See, Peter got it. Peter got it. He got that the gospel is for everyone and that he will be a witness to share with anyone who Jesus is. My question is, are you willing to step out in faith and do the same thing? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are just so amazingly blessed to be able to come into your presence. Lord, come into your sanctuary. God, in seeing 
that you are a holy God set apart. God, that you, you saw that we are in need of a Savior and you sent your Son to die for us. God, that is an incredible truth that we can hold on to. God, as we're studying this series in Acts, we've, we've labeled this section confidence. And we see as the disciples are growing in confidence in their faith that they've received it and they get it. Are they confident enough to share it with others? God, we thank you that they were. And God, I pray that we will be as well. That we are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. God, we thank you for this opportunity to read through your word, to study it. God, I pray that we would respond with adoration to you in the way that we sing and the way that we live our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.